All right. Again, welcome. Thank you for taking your time tonight to, to go over uh, you know this, our our, our biweekly uh, uh, call here. Uh, we wanted to start it off by uh, again we have some uh, with um, with COVID it changed our plans with our polar plunges and so we've we've got some new opportunities coming up as well. So we invited uh, Lisa over here to to share with you uh, some things that we have going on in the next couple of months. All right, hi guys. Um... For those who don't know me, I see some familiar faces, but um, I'm Elise Peters from the Region 6 Development Department, so planning Madison Polar Plunges, um, truck convoy, stuff like that. Um, just wanted to give you all a high-level overview of an event we have coming up in June. Um, it's called Sunrun and Solar Plunge, the first ever. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen some information come through your inboxes about it. Um, it's a continuation of our polar plunge campaign since we weren't able to gather as usual to do some kind of plunge into a lake or a pool this year. So I'm just going to show some slides that explain um, the event series coming up in June. All right, can everyone see the slideshow? Good. All right. So Sunrun and Solar Plunge, um, it's a um, Special Olympics event that will all be for Special Olympics Wisconsin. It goes right back to um, the state. It's a local event that we came up with after Polar Plunge, another way for us to think outside of the box and get together this year. So just high level concept, what is it? Um, it's a statewide June event series throughout the state. We'll have six um, in-person events and a virtual option all going on throughout June. Um, it'll be one to two events every single weekend. So I'll be in mid-morning with a 5K fun runner walk and a kid's dash. And all of the runs will be followed by the solar plunge piece, which will be plunging into a lake or a pool. For the kids runs, we might just do a sprinkler or a fire hose, something like that. A gentle fire hose, won't be that intense. Um, and then virtual option will be offered to anyone everywhere. I know we had some people who even participated virtually out of state for Polar Plunge. So it's gonna be a pretty similar model as that. Um, we just wanted to make sure we were meeting people's comfort levels as things start to slowly open up, but we know everyone is in a different situation. Um, and with that, we're gonna have kind of a block party atmosphere at the events. Um, because they're outside, we'll have stuff going on that's socially distanced, um, some food and beverage available, um, music going on. Um, all of this stuff will depend on locations, but I know various locations we're looking at um, having like some young athletes activities going on, um, just different things like that to really make it family friendly and a, an event like people want to come watch and be a part of in some capacity. Um, and the campaign will center on our young athletes program. That doesn't mean it's specifically for young athletes. We're just using the campaign as a platform to share all the opportunities within young athletes. So kind of saying, hey, come out and support Special Olympics, learn more about young athletes and do the sun run and solar punch. So it's just another way for us to share more about young athletes specifically, but it's open to all age groups to even have an option for zero to four year olds to register. They don't have to pay, but it's an option. Um, and so just a little bit more about the calls to action and how we're asking people to get involved. Um, there's the sun run part, so the run walk, the solar plunge piece. And then with this, I know that there's, you know, we have different COVID restrictions in parts of the state, especially because all of the events are in different parts of the state. There'll be different waves and various precautions that'll be going on to control the crowd size. Um, I'm planning the one in Madison specifically, so I'm having different 5k waves at 8, 9, 10, and maybe an 11 o'clock wave. Just to keep people spaced out, we'll keep waves to 100 people about um, and ask people to wear masks at the start line. That's where restrictions are right now. We all know that they could change by June, but hopefully they'll change for the better. Um, but all the different ways people can get involved. Of course, you can register and fundraise, you can donate to a team or an individual, invite your friends and family to be on your team. We always love people that are on, you know, the race course cheering people on. 
um, or you can volunteer. The latter is all awesome. And here are those dates for the in-person events that I was talking about. So we'll kick off the first weekend in June with a lacrosse plunge and a Green Bay plunge. Um, the next week will be Oshkosh and Oconomowoc. And then the following week will be in Madison or more specifically Monona. And then the last one will be at Milwaukee at the State Fair Park. So one to two every weekend, wanted to make sure we still spaced them out throughout the entire month so that we had some flexibility with weather. And just like Polar Plunge, this is an LHR event. So we have a partnership with Law Enforcement Torch Run. They're on all of our committees helping us plan the event, which is super, super awesome as we're trying to figure out the courses. They're the safety gurus and are helping us close down roads, figure out where we need to have some crosswalk help, things like that. Um, I know some officers are gonna have lead cars with their squad cars, so helping lead the race and also follow along afterwards to make sure everyone made it off the course safely. Um, but it'll be very closely tied with law enforcement and it's an LHER event. And our target markets are pretty much anyone and everyone, but specifically it's family friendly. There's a kids run, so kids dash, it's gonna be pretty short and sweet. So kiddos, four years old, five year old, you know, they can participate too. Um, and we really wanna make it a community feel, get a lot of our local partners involved. So um, yeah, anyone and everyone, we'd love to see you there. And then just to kind of add to the block party feel and some of those activities I touched on, um, we'll have big red raffle tickets for sale there. Um, food trucks, music, um, some lawn games like bag toss. Um, COVID safety will always be a top priority when planning these activities. So again, they'll just vary per location and really depend on where we are um, with COVID numbers at that time. But um, hopefully things just keep getting better. Most of these should be pretty family friendly and safe already, but yeah, just kind of a little feel of what that'll be like. And then price points for participants. So um, the, this campaign will be on the website we're currently using. So if you've signed up to do Polar Plunge in the last two years, um, it's the same login information, same website. It'll just look a little bit different. So it'll be sunny, not have a polar bear on it. Um, and it's registration with fundraising, which is a little bit different than Polar Plunge. So with Polar Plunge, you can register for free and then you fundraise as much as you want um, with that minimum benchmark of $75. With um, Sunrun and Solar Plunge, we're asking people to pay for a ticket first. So that registration piece um, being $35 for kids um, ages five to 10 and um, adults or kids 11 and up. The difference is if you're ages five to 10, you pay the $35, no additional fundraising required. If you're over that, um, we just ask that you raise that $40 to get to 75. Um, and ages zero to four for that kids dash um, is free. Or if you're pushing a stroller or something like that, we just have to make sure we gather that data and get a waiver filled out for everyone. Um, but similar price points, we just had to add in kind of a registration ticket um, when securing our timing for the races, making sure we're monitoring capacities closely, we decided to add a ticketed price, but hopefully that's just a good like kickstart to all of your awesome fundraising. So it'll be great. Um, and if you plunged this year, so if you went sledding or did a DIY plunge at home, there's a discount code coming really soon. So that'll be pretty awesome as well. Be on the lookout for that. That should be sent out this week or next week. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we'll do some more um, promotions for fundraising. There'll be some prizes. We're highlighting the Young Athletes program. So we have a Young Athletes Race Ambassador right now, Kira Thompson. She is going to be promoting the event, doing some cool videos with us um, and things like that. Um, we'll have some fun incentives for kids. So if kids do the kids stash, we're going to have medals. Um, if you do the at home or the virtual sun run and solar plunge, we'll also have a medal. 
If you wanna do the sun run at home with your pets, we're gonna have some really cute bandanas you can purchase too, little dog jog action, super cute. Um, and then all of this is on solarplunge.org. I know it's a lot of information. It's laid out really nicely there by our marketing team. Looks a lot prettier than this. So um, feel free to check that out. Um, and I can leave my email in the chat too if people have questions or it's on our website too. But any questions? I'll ask, I'll ask you a question here real quick, at least. Yeah. I know the yeah. ones that people are thinking about as, as we, you know, we typically do with Polar Plunge and Big Red Raffle and all that stuff. Is there a way, um, is there an a agency kickback or is there any ways that agencies can get involved in the fundraising game with this? Yeah, definitely. So similar structure as Polar Plunge, we're encouraging people to sign up, create a team, um, promote your agency that way. Um, and yeah, agencies will get a rebate. Great question. Ooh, awards. We've talked about doing awards for the races. I think that that'd be fun for some friendly competition. I'm not sure yet, but I, I think that'd be fun too, a little friendly competition. So to be determined. We might do like some costume contests too. So. Any other questions? Hopefully that's a, a good sign. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for letting me join the first part of your meeting. Um, if anyone's going to be at the track meet on May 9th, I'll see you at Long Jump. I'm excited to see everyone. Thanks, Elise. Thank you. Uh, and Brittany mentioned she will share the PowerPoint um, with the follow-up email as well as um, Mike already shared the, uh, the Solar Plunge webpage for us. So thanks, Mike, for that. Um, and um, so those will just keep coming out. Uh, we'll make sure that you're you're in the in the loop, and then if you're interested, uh, make sure to reach out to your uh, regional development staff, and they'll be able to help you out with uh, what you need for your fundraising for that. So, all right, we'll uh, we'll get going on uh, with our our normal. Let me pull up the uh, uh, the map here as we normally do. All right. So again, I always just want to share the Wisconsin Department of Health map just to, again, just give us a benchmark for where the state is currently sitting at. Uh, we did have a little bit of a two, three week stretch where, where the numbers had started to increase. Part of that, um, I think, you know, I think the, what, I've, what I've kind of interpreted from that was part of it, people getting their first shots and getting a little bit more comfortable getting out and then being nicer outdoors and people gathering and some of those type of things. But Fortunately, it seems like this past week we're starting to level out. Uh, reminder that the number for outdoor events that we're looking for um, to be in phase two is 350 or below. Um, so it's a little bit of a higher threshold for outdoor events. Um, the indoor events, uh, which the, the last remaining indoor event that we have for a little bit is our swim events. And that one is still at 100. Um, but those ones aren't coming up until, um, until um, June. So hopefully we'll be able to get some time for these, these numbers to start to go down. As you can see, the statewide burden number right now is at 155.6. So obviously there's a couple of counties here that are doing really well um, and a couple of other counties that are a little bit high. So hopefully again, as we start to level out and start to go down a little bit, um, this will help as far as um, participation is at our events and participation um, at practices and all that type of stuff. Um, and then just in general, um, the lower these numbers get, the happier we all get. Um, the restrictions start to go away once they start to get real low. So we're hoping that we're heading that direction. So again, just to like to start the meeting off that way, just so we have a, a snapshot, we're all on the same page. These are the numbers that we've been monitoring and going with. So uh, just wanted to share that. Um, so today, um, either today or tomorrow, I don't know if you have, if you have not received them today, um, the local program manager should have received a memo. Uh, we sent it out that includes some, uh, some updated information. Um, one one part of the memo is just an overview of what the sports seasons will look like going forward for the rest of the year, just to give you an idea for planning purposes. Uh, it's always kind of been our intention to modify the first half of the year to try to make sure that we can do things safely. And then as best as we can the second half of the year, which is going to be starting with our outdoor sports season to run that as, no, as close to normal as we possibly can. Again, 
we made the adjustments um, based on the current situation in the first half of the year. So we're always monitoring numbers, we're monitoring situations, and if things have to change, we'll change them. But I think a lot of teams are starting to practice for softball here in the next few weeks. And so with doing so, um, would you guys get going on that? We try to keep it as, as close to what we have originally planned as we possibly can, because we know there's a lot of stress and interest for teams around to do some of that type of stuff. So, um, that's what we wanted to give a recap on that. But the other big part about that is we've gone through and, and reviewed some information um, as we're kind of continuing to do. Um, we meet Thursday mornings um, as a sports staff to go over the Wisconsin Department of Health. And that's when we go through the petition requests. But also, we, so we're monitoring the Wisconsin Department of Health stuff. We know there's been some recent uh, updates through the CDC and the World Health Organization. And then as well as talking to some of our other states, um, from Special Olympic State programs, trying to modify it and work with you. And also the one big thing that we've heard from a lot of our local programs is it's really difficult for to start a softball season with, uh, with, a, with a maximum of 10 people. And so with all that in mind, um, we've had a conversation um, and decided to, to move on some of those maximum numbers at um, our activities, including practices and competitions for different levels. And we've also known from some of the research that um, outdoor events, our outdoor activities are safer than indoor activities, just with the airflow and the amount of um, ability to social distance and all that type of stuff. And so we did decide to uh, yeah, yeah. set different, um, to set different uh, numbers for both indoor and outdoor events. So uh, starting immediately, we'll, we'll switch over to these for phase one, for the, for the phasing stuff. So indoor for phase one, now the maximum is 15, which what it previously was 10. So that's 15 total people again. So that includes athletes and coaches and volunteers. Uh, for outdoor events, that number, since again, being safer to be outdoors, we, we move that number to 25. Um, so that should help with those programs starting softball practices here in the next couple of weeks. Um, for phase two, uh, we've moved the, the indoor number we have not changed, that's still at 50, uh, but the outdoor number we've increased to 100. Um, for phase three, we previously not actually had set a number for what our activity sizes would be. We just said we would increase the size of our activities. And so to provide some clarity, we've decided that phase three would set some parameters for that. So indoor events in phase three would be at 150 and outdoor events would be at 300. And then of course, if the numbers get low enough, uh, hopefully we'll get back to phase four sooner than later. And phase four is, is it will re, we remove restrictions and go back to operating as, as we previously did pre-COVID. So I think we all, uh, we all, we all hope that there's a, a sooner finish line to that than later, but we also know we're, we're kind of working around with what the current situation is. So with doing that, we've been able to, um, again, we wanted to listen to what your needs were, but also listen to what um, what's ever changing in the in restrictions and all that to modify our programs according to that. So, did anybody have any any questions about about our changes in, the, in those max participation numbers? Can you show us that, please? I'd like to see that. What the what the numbers are? I'd what? like to see the memo. The memo. Um, yeah. We can we can we can set we can. I can get it on the, the post coach's email uh, contact. Okay. And I can send it over to, to her. That'd be a little bit easier than going through that, that memo um, right now for that. So yeah, Jane, Jane had asked no direct or, or the, 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 indirect, the, to, the no direct contact um, still in effect for phase one for outdoors at this point. Yes. We're still doing with no indirect, with no direct contact for that phase one for that first two weeks. So um, those who are doing softball, um, we had shared a last coaches meeting that there are some softball drills through the um, softball assessments uh, tests that uh, have include indirect or um, that don't include contact, uh, direct contact or any of that. Um, so recommendations to go through that. Um, Brit uh, um, Brittany will uh, attest to doing some of the fitness side of things for those sports for the first couple of weeks as you get into that thing, into um going through that and then you can petition for phase two after two weeks of practice to get direct contact when you talk about fielding drills and, and batting and all that type of stuff. So, yep, we're still keeping that the, the, the phase restrictions outside of the maximum um, number of people are still the same. It's just the number of people that we're allowing at practice that we have changed for this at this point. And I will make, um, and I got asked to mass, mass still required for outdoors. Um, so yes, the, um, so there's two reasons why it's still, we're still having the masks for outdoor events. Uh, one, I know that the CDC came out and, and mentioned for fully vaccinated individuals, 
being outdoors where you're not in a crowd that the mask recommendation is not there. Uh, again, we're not, we're not requiring proof of vaccination for, for our practices or doing anything like that. It also just in the nature of having an event or a practice, you are, you are creating a crowd for that, um, especially as we increase the numbers for those activities. So at this point, uh, masks are still required. We're gonna continue to work with, um, and I will also tell you right now too, um, especially when you come to our coming out to events, a lot of the facilities that we use, um, regardless of what our policy would be, would still be mask mandated as well. And, and so we need to follow some of those type of things too. So just, to, I appreciate the question to clarify, but at this point we're still requiring the mask aspect. Um, and again, um, we'll, I'll get to the, where the exceptions are as we go through the individual sports, but um, um, that's just kind of the mindset behind that at this point. But again, we'll update you as soon as possible uh, if anything else were to change based on what we've learned from the CDC or or Wisconsin Department of Health or other uh, organizations that we've been working with uh, to make these decisions. So. All right. Jason, I have a question. Sure. A question. Sure. Um, you talked about masks. What about taking temperatures? What about sanitizing equipment? Yep. Like, like I mentioned, yeah, it, our, the other protocol, the pieces of the protocols have not changed. It's just been the, ma the maximum numbers for our phases. Um, have changed. There's going to be a, I, I was going to update too, and I guess this, guess this is a good time as, as ever. Um, as we're moving towards our events, um, there's a little bit of a modification for the screening process at our events to try to make things as efficient and, and, and minimize um, alliance and backups with, with groups that, that, that uh, you know, from different agencies and all that. So what we're gonna do for events and we'll send it along with pre-event information is that we've modified that agency screening that you would do typically for your practices. Um, you'll get ahead of time so you're able to fill in the names and then be able to check off. But we're gonna ask that agencies will do a screening either prior to leaving or when they get immediately when they get on site. And you will check, you'll ask the questions and be able to check off that nobody has symptoms for that day. And then a representative from your program will sign off and then bring that to pick up their registration packet. And that way we won't have a screening, one screening table that you're backed up in and all that type of stuff. We did a screening, we did do a screening station at Winter Games. And with the number of athletes we had, we still, at times it was either completely dead or, or a little bit busy. And we we're just trying to um, prevent backups in some of those situations. So again, you'll get those forms ahead of time. We'll get those to you. Um, I know registrations have come in um, for all of our track and soccer competitions here. So as you get some pre-event information, that form will come out, but we'll still be doing the screening questions and doing all that type of stuff. And we still need to be diligent about contact tracing in case somebody does test positive for COVID. Um, so the protocols are still all in place for practice? Correct, yep. Okay. Yep, and that, that mod modified form is just for the, the events mm -hmm. okay. at this point. Any other questions? Uh, spectators, regional track meet, need to sign up. So specifically for spectators at each event. Uh, so, um, so what I would tell you to do for Dan, um, touch base with, uh, I believe, uh, with your uh, tournament director for that. So with Nicole, um, there's a process. So uh, with our spectator memo, as we we mentioned, a lot of this stuff has actually been dictated by the venues that we're going to. For outdoor events, we're limiting it to two spectators per individual. And, and if you're wondering how we're monitoring that, um, there is a process for it. Essentially, we'll, 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 um, the, the plan right now, and um, I don't know, Nicole, if you want to jump in here too. Um, um, the spectator memo we also sent out with that with that sports memo today, but um, we'll be providing some wristbands to for, with a number of wristbands for your program, so we know, um, you know, so if spectators will just have a wristband, so we know that they they've been with your program. And then uh, mm -hmm. typically at our events, there'll be uh, designated spectator areas that we would ask them to be in, so. Yeah, so for the region six track meet spectators, when they check in for the COVID screening, um, if they aren't on your list that you've already completed, um, we'll just ask them what agency they're with and mark that down. We won't ask for a specific athlete. Um, so that's the way it'll go for now. If we run into any issues, um, obviously that may change moving forward, but for now we're just gonna trust that you guys are communicating with your um, families and caregivers and that you truly will only bring two spectators per athlete. Can we, uh, so I, and I will put this out as we're talking about our, our upcoming events for our summer game sports. Um, um, 
you know, just like you guys, you know, adapting to, to your policies and all that stuff and practices, you know, we're going to learn some stuff as we go through, as we've increased, uh, you know, doing some of these events, um, especially these outdoor events. Uh, there's a huge difference between indoor events and outdoor events as far as um, the number, number of entry points and how you can direct traffic and doing all that type of stuff. And we're going to do our best to communicate what we're doing and, and making sure that we keep it safe that way. Um, but I, I do know, especially for, you know, Nicole and Michaela, what they're, they're, they're the two tournament directors for the region three and six track meets coming up next weekend. We're going to learn some things from those meets that will carry over to other events, whether that's just for me or our future outdoor sports events. So as we go through these processes and procedures and you go out in or at our events that, uh, you know, we appreciate the, any feedback we can get back on some of these things because we're, we're learning as we go a little bit too, uh, just knowing that, you know, the last outdoor event we had was winter games and winter games was about uh, 30 some athletes spread out across a couple of venues. And so we're, we're going to be learning along with you on some of these things, these things. So we really do want to make sure that, um, we get your feedback on these or what things worked and what things didn't work and we can move forward and, and continue to offer safe events for everybody. All right. Um, and we'll, you know, I'll continue to watch the chat. If you think of any other questions in regards to that stuff, I'll just keep moving forward. So again, for just, uh, just want to do a brief overview with the, uh, with any of the uh, events that we have coming up with, with any updates that I have. So track, um, again, just to remind people, and for those who haven't been on calls or haven't dug through the rules, we are doing a station approach. We'll have four stations mm -hmm. um, that you'll be rotating through. And so there'll be two on track events and two field events. Uh, going through registrations, there are some um, athletes that are registered for all for, for an event at each station. There are some athletes that are registered for you know, two events or three events, um, your, your, your agency is going to be assigned a time and a group and you'll rotate with that group. So if, if you do have athletes in that group that aren't participating in uh, an event at a specific station, they will just maintain with that group during that time frame. The rotation at each uh, event space should be about 30 minutes. So it, even, uh, even with, um, you know, if you're not doing a, a softball throw or, or, or mini jab, um, you have an athlete that's not registered for that, they would still follow the group over to that section. Um, if you do have an athlete that, that you know, let's say they have an event at station one and station two, and they no longer have anything about that, they will, um, you know, then, you know, it's up to you as a program if, if they would, if you want them just to go ahead and leave the venue if they're completely done with events or to stay with your group, but um, they would not, we would want them to stay with the group. Um, you know, if they have three events and it just happen to be one of the stations that, that, that they're not participating in. So just a good idea um, with that. Um, again, uh, talking about masks outdoor, this was one of the exception points so that we'll have masks being worn while you're outdoors, but during cardiovascular activities, so that would be the on-track events and the running long jump, uh, during those, um, the mask can be pulled down just during the competition for that. And then, um, and then, um, and then once they're done with the cardiovascular activity, we're asking them to pull the mask back up again. And the other exception would be when, when drinking water, um, you know, obviously uh, we're gonna do our best to, uh, to, you know, to make sure to remind people for, for the mask, but it, we do you know, re rely on coaches and, and um, agency managers to also just be able to help us monitor some of these things. I know it's not always the, the most fun conversation. I know that mask is uh, sometimes a debated topic but just know that you know we, we have these protocols, so we're able to run these events. Um, and 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 unfortunately, we have a problem with some of our protocols, and uh, we may not have venues that are allowing us to run events, or we may have to pull back on some of these things. So uh, I'm not saying that as a threat. I'm just saying that that, that this is just the reality of kind of what, where we're at right now as far as these events go. So uh, we do we do uh, ask that uh, you guys you know we're partners in this, both you know uh, why we're meeting. And also during our events and during your practices. So um, if we can all just work together to make uh, to try to help this, that'd be great um, with that. So, um, and then see, are the athletes that are only doing two state events and then they're less? Wait, okay. So the question is, are athletes that uh, may only be doing two events and they are the last two events, do they still need to be with the group at the first station? So Brenda, that was asked by Brenda. So. My answer to that is yes. We want to have everybody checked into that first station, and then they'll rotate through all four events. But if, let's say, they're doing the 100 meter and the long jumps, and that happens to be station one and two at your venue, 
they would be able to leave early from that, but we do want everybody checked into that first station because it's going to make things a little bit easier for us to monitor as people come in and out. So um, that that would be my answer is that for if I, your schedule, you we want athletes to be there when your schedule state first station scheduled to be started. So again, this is a little bit different than than a normal track year, and, and a lot of times. Uh, being on site for two hours is a lot shorter than they have been in previous years for, for a track meet. So while I do understand um, there's a little bit of waiting, especially if you're going to wait, you know, 40 to one, 40 minutes to an hour to get to your first event from an athlete, um, it, you know, it, it's still going to be the, it, we have to, it's, it's a way for us to best manage um, people coming in and out of our competition area, as well as the, the flow of the event. So, um, so uh, that I would say, yes, they need to be there for their first station. Like we have a raised hand, Sharon, did you have a question? You'll have to unmute yourself. Or feel free to type it in the chat if that is easier. So I'm trying to get this. So if you have 17 athletes in track yep. and you have, you have some coaches, they'll get a station, mm -hmm. um, they'll get a group and a station and the whole 17 athletes and the coaches go throughout these four stations. Is that right? Together? Yeah. So, so yeah, if you had, so with your program, you have 17 and um, there's, there's one minor exception to this, but we'll, we'll, we'll answer this question straight on first. So your, your, your agency would be scheduled together um, and, and assigned. So let's say your, your, your event, um, you're going to be, let's say you're in our first shift um, and we'll assign you at 9 a.m. at station one. So all of your athletes will be assigned to the same station and you'll rotate together as the same group through all four stations. And so at each one of those stations, there is both the uh, development event, developmental level event and a traditional event. Um, so that, you know, that's what you've signed up for the athletes for those things. So they have the opportunity if they signed up for four events, they would do one, they'd run their event and then they would have to wait for everybody to finish that station and then we'd rotate to the next station and all four groups rotate at the same time. And they so, compete against other agencies, no matter so, what the divisions are, is that right? Yep. So we are divisioning everybody across the entire track meet, um, but we are gonna try to make heats that you would run with athletes of similar abilities, but they would may not be in the same division, your final time would be placed based on how the other athletes in your division have been placed. So similar to those uh, who go to track meets that have like an open pit for, for throwing and jumping events, um, you know, you would go and you would throw with three other athletes, but those athletes may not be in your division, but you still got placed within your division. It's the same concept for the on-track events this year as well. Okay, now I get it. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, Beth? Um, so we're theoretically thinking that we're going to be out of there before noon or what's well, the dep lunch? We, we got to, it depends on our, the, the meet that you're at. So you have to, I guess you have to remember that because there are some meets that are, uh, it depends on meat size. So for example, I'm, I, I'm running the region eight meet. We have a, about 175, 180 athletes that are, are registered. And so in order for us to do our numbers correctly, we would have a short, two short distance shifts scheduled and then a long distance. Shift. So this, this meet will go on for longer, but you'll only be there for a two hour increment of that time frame. So I'm, I can't speak directly to the region two meet based on the numbers. And I don't know uh, if, if Amber's gotten to the point of what the schedule will look like for that. But I will tell you with this year, especially with being on site for a shorter period of time that we aren't providing lunches this year at track. But I, I won't be able to tell you if you're there from nine to eleven, if you're there from, you know, one to three. It just depends on what your individual track meet will look like. Thank you. Yep. Uh, no. So the other question is, if a group does not have athletes participating in a specific station, will the station be skipped if possible? So the answer to that is is not is probably not um, because. Um, it, the, the other groups, the, the stations will be filled by other groups um, at the time. So we'll schedule four different groups. And so one person will be scheduled at group one, one will be at two, one is three, and one at four. And then when we say rotate, four will move to one, one will move to two, two will move to three, and three will move to four. So if you had, even if you don't have athletes that are participating in a field event per se, um, you, you, would have to, you would hang out at that station for the, the 20 to 30 minutes 
until, and, and what we'll do as meet managers is once we've seen all the athletes have, have completed all their stations, then we'll rotate at that point rather than making you wait for 30 minutes for no reason. So we will try to make that, that time as efficient as possible. But uh, yes, you would have to be at the station even if you have events, like if you have, let's say you didn't do any long jumps for your agency, you, you would still hang out at that station. Um, and we'll do our best to do it by agency. But again, um, our group sizings will be around 25. So for an agency that has about 25 athletes, you'll be just with your agency. If you have you know, 15, you may be paired with an agency that registers with 10 athletes, but then maybe two agencies at one station. And then I will go from there. So um, I hope that helps. Yeah, so somebody wanted a clarification about lunches. So we are not providing athlete lunches this time around um, for a couple of reasons. One, again, uh, athletes will be on site for a shorter period of time this time around and then also too, just it's a lot more difficult with COVID precautions to be able to get lunches the way we need them to be to safely distribute them. So um, so athlete lunches will not be provided this time for track, uh, that is correct. And um, I would also believe to say that that would also be the case for swim as well. Um, and we'll get to swimming here as well. Uh, lastly, um, um, and then Mike Stewart asked, uh, the state meet will run the same way. We are planning to keep things consistent um, for our athletes. And so um, what I would say is um, this time around for a state meet, if an athlete's participating in four events and you qualify them for state, we'll just keep them in the same four events uh, rather than saying they can only do stuff that they finish first, second, and third in. So that way they can still participate, participate in all stations at state, but we will still do a station approach at the state track meet just to keep it consistent for the season. So thanks for that question, Mike. Um, the, other quite, the other thing I was just gonna mention, and, and Mark was gonna send out an email to local program managers tomorrow, I believe, um, if he hasn't already. Um, but we are, um, with these meets, we are, um, we've tried to be as transparent as possible with our struggles with things as well. Uh, volunteers to come back, active volunteers are, are a little bit on the lower end right now. And, and we're trying to go through our channels. Uh, we've kind of, I mentioned multiple times that you know, for these meets, we're, we're doing, you know, four times the work for a quarter of the athletes sometimes. And uh, that, that, that's kind of been the, the case for, for volunteers as well. Um, um, and so uh, Mark was just going to send something out to see if you, if you guys do know of any active volunteer groups in your area or any, any like students who actively need volunteer um, hours, feel you please just, if you, you wouldn't mind sharing those with, uh, with your uh, local athletic director, um, and we can get you get people connected with these meets. Again, uh, we're going through our normal channels, and the numbers are are, are you know ten percent of what we would normally get in some of these things. So we're, we're doing our best to try to to uh, accommodate those things, and you know and and, and hopefully we'll want to get to a point. But um, you know if we are not able to get bodies in there, we'll we'll just be creative and maybe ask coaches to to step into a role for whether at a station or something like that. So we appreciate any support that you guys can provide on some of those things, but we are still doing our best as tournament directors to provide um, everything done uh, in-house as best we can. But uh, just to kind of give you a heads up and just be as transparent as possible when we've had problems with um, getting venues, we we're all on the same page there. And I know um, with agencies, I know volunteers are coming back to score and it's the same thing as they have volunteers. So just to keep everybody heads up on all that different stuff. Uh, Alyssa had asked about all right, so yep. So Alyssa had asked if your agency has short distance uh, runners and long distance runners, that would be the exception where your athletes would not be uh, in a group with the rest of your uh, agency. So if you have a long distance runner, so that's a run, long distance runners or walkers, that's a 400 meter or 800 meter, at the end of all our meets will be a long distance meet, uh, uh, shift. And so in that shift, all the long distance runners will be in one group, and all the long distance walkers will be in one group. And then what we'll do is that the runners will be on the track while the walkers are doing field events and the walkers will be on the track while the runners are doing field events. And that was our way to be able to utilize the full track. So that would be the ones that the, actually the two scheduling differences would be the long distance one at the end of the, the uh, end of the meet and then wheelchair events will happen immediately at the beginning of your meet. Um, and what uh, tournament directors will be looking to do is you know, if I, what I'm looking to do at my meet is if you have a long distance runner, I'm going to try to schedule you in the late, the latest short distance shift so that your agency would be doing back to back shifts there. So that can help with a coach that needs to be on site for both. 
And if you have a wheelchair athlete, I would try to do you in the if you schedule your agency in the first shift so that you could do the back to back on that side of things. Um, if you have both a wheelchair athlete and a long distance athlete, then then there's uh, my hands are tied a little bit, and maybe I'll touch base to, with you and see what your preference are. But that's kind of the way we're looking to plan some of those things. So it's not a perfect system and being able to get all the, the events in from an agency in one shift, but we're gonna to try to keep them together for those of you who have that. And I think um, for my meet, I think um, there's one or two agencies that have that problem. So we'll, we'll probably end up scheduling in, in that second shift, um, second short distance shift on my end. All right. Um, Moving on to swim, uh, registrations will be coming up towards the end of um, mid to end May, end of May, uh, May here for our early June district swim events. Um, we have the three locations set for the district events. All the Northern um, swimmers will be at UW Stevens Point on June 5th. And that's um, regions two, three, four, and five will be at that meet. Um, and you're, uh, I'll have to remember, um, Nicole, yours is in the Dells on the, 11th, 12th, or oh, June 6th, sorry. You're on the same weekend, the, just that Sunday, okay. And then the following uh, weekend would be uh, the O'Connor Walk Meet, which would be seven and eight. Um, and so again, for that one, uh, we may shift it out where we would do all the events, but we would schedule you by your agency. It may just be, instead of doing one big swim meet, it might be two shifts of the same swim meet, but with just less athletes, um, those shifts would take maybe two to two and a half hours, depending on the number of athletes we have in those. I think the numbers we're anticipating may mean that we have a lot of swim meets that may just be the one shift. But again, we're, we're going to analyze that as the registrations come in. So we will try to give for all of this. I know it's important from your planning perspective to understand what schedule you'll be on. So we're going to do our best to get some of those schedules out as soon as we can. But just know it's another aspect that we haven't dealt with in one of these events before. So we're, we're really trying to do our best to do that, but also make sure we're sending you just one schedule and not two schedules, or three schedules, or whatever on that. So again, with that, um, I got a lot of questions about state swim. So I can unfortunately say I don't have a venue confirmed as of right now. I can tell you, though, it will be on June 27th, whichever venue we're at. <laughs> so I am waiting. I have a I have a one that we've been working on and I have a backup venue. So I can tell you both those dates will be June 27th that we have them. I cannot tell you the area of the state that they're in because there are two different areas of the state, but we will get that out. Um, I, was, I was hoping to hear um, sometime in the next week or so to have that officially announced. I promise you the second I find out the venue is confirmed, I will confirm it with all of you, but it will be June 27th for planning purposes um, from that side of things. Um, Lastly, so the la uh, not, last but not least, soccer. Uh, we have nine teams registered for state soccer this year from around the state. Um, so we have good representation around the state. We just have numbers are down a little bit. Soccer is the one exception, again, that we are requiring masks during participation of soccer. Again, um, the reasoning behind that is that that is one sport that we cannot control distancing while participating in the event. Um, it is not um, unheard of when looking at other um, sports leagues and sport tournaments that are similar to ours. Um, and um, again, if there's if there's some serious concerns about that, please reach out to myself as the tournament director. We can talk through some of those things. But that's the reasoning behind doing some of those type of things. Um, and then um, um, soccer again at McGuanago High School um, on May 15th, the same date and location as the regional track meet in Region 8. Um, and we do, uh, from soccer people who, who've been at those competitions, we do have the support from ABB again. So those, those volunteers and sponsors will be out again. And that was a great group to help support that competition. So um, um, they're excited to be back and, and seeing competition happening with that again. Um, last piece of reminder too is uh, we, some of us just got off of a USA Games coaches meeting. We've selected USA Games coaches for Team Wisconsin. Um, and then now we're still in the process of getting nominations for uh, athletes coming in. So right now, currently open is track and swimming. Um, we could go through all the events that could potentially that that we would uh, use for qualifying, but they're all uh, we can uh, send the link um, in our follow up um, that has those all listed. Um, we are taking first place finishers in those in track and swimming in the designated events that from the 2018 and 2019, or yeah, 2018 and 2019 summer games. 
or first place finishes at the district level or regional level competitions for those sports this year. And the reasoning just behind that, knowing that some people are not as comfortable traveling to a state event um, and our numbers this year are down. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we were using the district numbers for those. So first place, um, uh, Debbie had asked, uh, how do we get places from 2018, 2019? Reach out to your athletic director. We can pull those up pretty easily. Yep. So, um, or you can reach out to, to, to myself or the COVID email. We can pull that up pretty easily. So if you have any questions on that. Um, if, if an athlete gets not, so uh, right now the uh, athlete or parent is filling out the nomination forms for athletes that do get nominated. We are following up with agency managers to ask about the appropriateness for those athletes um, playing for USA Games. And we are also following up that they meet the qualifications. Standard. So uh, just because somebody gets nominated uh, doesn't mean that they're, they're automatically going to camp or anything for that stuff. We will follow up with those who aren't appropriate for that. And then we'll follow up with those who are advancing the camp. But anybody who's nominated, meet the qualifications and the agency manager signs off on that would be invited to camp in September. So, um, and then we'll keep people updated as we know more information COVID wise for camp and all that. So if you have any athletes who'd love to go, it's in Orlando in June of 2022. Um, all the meetings we've been on, it's gonna be, uh, they're pulling out all the stops at Disney. So it's gonna be a really cool experience. And so we're excited to get, uh, start to get more and more nominations and our bowling nominations are closed uh track and swimming are out there and then we'll start to get our ost sports out there as well um, as we're bringing bocce and softball as part of our ost and so um, again as those nomination forms can become available we'll send them out they're on our website under the usa games page um, and if you have any questions specifically about athletes or specific sport feel free to reach out to your athletic director or myself all right that's what i have <laughs> Um, I just wanted to talk about the summer fitness competition. We are doing another round of the fitness competition starting in June. Um, our first one was such a success that we decided to do it again. So um, similar to the spring, um, there is a virtual option. So you could do it, um, athletes could do it either on their own completely, or you could do it as an agency um, via Zoom if, that, if that's what athletes are comfortable with or you're comfortable with. Um, it could be done um, in a fitness specific practice, if you're getting together specifically for fitness, or I would highly encourage if you are getting together for your practices, particularly the outdoor season, it seems to line up with that the most, um, just add it on to your outdoor practice. You know, fitness hopefully is a component of your practices already. Um, so it shouldn't be too much to add that um, in and then they can get awarded based on that. Um, we'll have an individual level um, unified doubles, which is a great option for um, families, coaches to get involved as well. Um, and then also traditional doubles. Um, I encourage doubles just because it holds, um, holds people accountable when they're doing their fitness if they have a partner in crime to do it with. Um, but those are the three options. Um, we will have three different intensity levels, so low, moderate, and high. Um, and within each of those levels will be three exercises. So if you were um, doing the fitness competition in the spring, we had four. Um, we narrowed it down to three to better suit the outdoor sports needs. Um, so those will focus on balance, upper body strength, and cardio. Um, I won't get into the specifics of what those exercises are. Um, it is all on our website. Um, and I'll share that link in the follow-up email as well. The medical deadline is the same as the outdoor sports season, so that's June 1st. Um, Preseason scores are to be collected June 7th through the 13th, and they're due June 13th. Um, there is a mid-season score then in early July, and then the end of season score um, would be collected July 26th through August 1st. Um, so the season ending on August 1st. Um, all those dates are on our website, and again, I'll share that um, in the follow-up um, with you all. Um, we do encourage coaches, like I said, you could run your own practices, um, but we will also have a SOE led practice. Um, of course, that'll be virtual so that um, anyone can join. Um, we have an intern this summer um, from the kinesiology department at UW-Madison, um, and he will be leading practices Tuesdays at seven for anyone that's interested. And in fact, I you don't have to do I get up. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, in fact, you don't even have to be part of the fitness competition to join the practices. We encourage everyone to join. Um, there will be an optional coaches training on Tuesday, May 25th. 
at seven o'clock. Um, this really is just gonna go deeper into the exercises in particular, um, not only what they are, but how to perform them safely um, and how to uh, score them. Um, coaches will collect a raw score and then our SOE staff will work on converting that to percentages and percent improvement and all that good stuff. Um, athletes are able to participate in the fitness competition as well as any other sport that they're doing. In fact, I encourage it. Um, fitness is a great way to improve your sport performance. So um, we highly encourage folks that are already participating just to tag this along with. Um, it's a great way to get not only more fit, but um, get another award, which everybody wants. So um, any questions on the fitness competition? I think, Ladina, did you have your hand up? Yeah, you were kind of cutting out. You froze for a second. So I didn't know if that was you or me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I don't know um, what part was missed. <laughs> it, it wasn't missed just the very, at the end that you were done talking anyway. So my question was, um, so like if myself as the agency manager and my coaches don't want to like run the fitness program, like, but we have athletes that may be interested, like, do they have to sign up under our agency or how does that work? So they can sign up um, separately. Um, ideally, if there's a large amount of them, it would be nice to have some lead person have it kind of compiled into one registration um, just for ease sake. But, um, and that could be any coach or parent or, or anyone. Um, but we did have athletes compete separately without the agency um, involvement in the spring and that worked out just fine. Did that answer your question? Um, kind of, <laughs> I guess I'm just wondering, like if I offer it out to my athletes, like I, I can't take, you know, I can't take another thing on and I'm not sure my coaches want to either. Right. And so if I didn't like, have it, should I even be putting it out there for athletes? Yeah, they could, they could compete the fitness exercises, um, at home on their own and submit a registration form directly to the athletic director. Okay. So I would just make that clear in my email. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions related to the fitness competition? Um, just a couple, if you think of anything, feel free to reach out to me or um, in the chat or to my follow-up email. Um, but I just wanted to give a couple quick save the dates. Um, next Tuesday, May 4th, um, from 5 to 6.30, we'll be having a spring season celebration ceremony, um, just honoring anyone's invited, but really highlighting and honoring those that um, participated this spring in um, any of our sports. Um, there'll be the first 45 minutes will be a scavenger hunt for athletes um, or anyone. I think scavenger hunts are really fun um, to participate in. And then the last 45 minutes will be a dance, which of course everyone loves. So. Um, the more the merrier, please share that um, with your athletes. It is on our events calendar, but I'll also include a link in the follow-up email. Um, another reminder, we are doing a SOE Live yoga series right now. So every Sunday at seven for the month of May, ends May 23rd is the last day. Um, we have a certified yoga instructor leading us through some um, yoga series. Um, we had our first one last weekend and it was a great success. So. Anyone is welcome to join, not just athletes, but coaches, parents, whoever, um, it, it's a good time. And then lastly, we do have our um, virtual Unified Leadership Conference, um, Saturday, May 22nd, um, from about eight to one. Um, that registration is also available on our website, but I will send a link as well. Um, everyone and anyone is welcome, athletes, coaches, families, volunteers, LETR, there'll be a bunch of staff on, um, the more the merrier, um, got a lot of good stuff planned. So um, please have people register for that. Um, I guess before I open it up completely, I, I don't know, Jason, if you wanna mention the new schedule. Yep. yep, I can do that. But before I do that, I just wanna mention if anybody gets on the scavenger hunts, Brittany's hyper competitive in those. So. <laughs> um, I'm, slow, I'm slow these days though. <laughs> So um, as we're moving into a, a heavier event load and all that type of stuff, um, what we've decided to do for these coaches meetings moving forward 
is that we're going to do a coaches meeting per season uh, moving forward, um, just so we can get through sports specific information for that season. Uh, we appreciate everybody who's been on every other week since August. Um, it's been a, it's been a, you know, uh, we've been pretty consistent with some of those. Uh, we will have, um, you know, tournament directors may choose to have their own event specific uh, coaches meeting leading up to events um, for for, for uh, going forward too. Um, so those 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 coaches meetings may come up on those side of things, but it's just a decision to try to uh, be uh, cognizant of, of uh, your time as well as we can do our busy season for event planning. We've decided to move to a, a seasonal approach. So with that in mind, our next coaches meeting will be uh, Thursday, May 27th. And that will be focusing on our outdoor sports season. So that will be um, uh, bocce, softball, t-ball, tennis, and golf is included in that as well. So we will be going over some of the more specific outdoor sports stuff. We'll continue to send communications as far as updates for COVID protocols and all that type of stuff moving forward. Uh, and then obviously if something major were to happen um, one way or the other with COVID protocols, we would, we would schedule another meeting just to cover some of those things. But uh, just again, being cognizant of everybody's time uh, moving forward, and and knowing that um, um, that uh, productive, uh, being productive with the sports seasons coming up, that's what we wanted to do for that. So May 27th will be the next one, and then we will send out to. I'll be uh, looking at other dates for the moving forward on that, um, and that this may be something that we may continue to do outside of of COVID as a resource for people too, of, of going through sports seasons and offering a, a time to meet and talk through any rule changes and that type of things. Um, now that we have a virtual outlet, um, it makes things a little bit easier to do some of these things. So May 27th at 7 p.m. It's a Thursday. We'll keep the Thursdays at 7 p.m. As the, as the way we go with this. Um, and then we'll send out future dates after that. Regional staff will also continue to, ho to hold those quarterly agency meetings as well. So in addition to the season preview, I think most of us have them scheduled for June. Um, so that'll go into more of some of the like regional specific stuff. And again, that's open to coaches, athletes, um, families, everyone. And Jason, do you see the question about cornhole or maybe Don? Don's excited, <laughs> he unmuted. <laughs> Answer is yes. No, <laughs> yes, we will have cornhole. Yep. So we are planning on um, offering uh, a state cornhole competition alongside our state flake football um, in October. So right now, I think we're looking at the first or second weekend of October um, um, at Nina High School, but we'll continue to give more information as that gets finalized. And just something that kind of connects the summer to the fall, we did just get word. I thought we had the date set, but I think they changed it um, for the state cross country. So we had worked with a group from Kenosha Running Company that ran a cross country event for us and we called it a state event. Um, it's a lot of fun. And so if you have runners now during track um, and they'd like to continue running, uh, that will be October 30th and um, Haley, it's in region, well, I don't have to check. Is it still in region seven? They may have moved it. Either way, you can contact me if you want um, or any of your athletic directors. We'll start to get up on the website. But when you think about cross country, you think about long distance where it's fun event because it's it's with another meet, um, but they have short event as, uh, the shortest event is 800 meters. So it's not like you have to run a lot. They have 800, 1600, I think a 3K and a 5K. Um, and so it's out on grass, it's out in the open. Um, we'll have to figure out the COVID specifics, but you know, that's not until October 30th. So we've got some time, but just put that on your calendar and we'll, you'll see more about that as well. That's in Elkhorn too. So it is in region seven. Um, so contact is, <laughs> is that a state park? <laughs> and they have, they have the website up already too for registrations I saw. So we'll get that stuff out to everybody soon. Oh, we have an athlete health uh, messenger quarterly meeting on May 25th. Just to update that. Thanks, Mike. A any other questions? I know we went through a lot tonight. It was a, it was a heftier meeting. So uh, anybody have any other questions? Otherwise, um, yeah, Dev, go ahead. You went through my massive list. I still have a few left. Um, I'm still confused about softball 
because of it not being somewhat of a contact sport, we we can't start for two weeks. We got to be in phase one, which is, and then something about those um, skill type things. Where do I have? Yep. So, Bev, I can. Um... I'll, I'll, I'll send you over, because I'll, I know we sent out with the last coaches meet, but I'll send you over the, the, the skills assessment test, the old skills assessment test that we used to require for softball. They have some good drills that are not direct contact. Uh, there's a base okay. running drill, there's a, a throwing drill and that type of stuff, um, a fielding drill, where uh, that would be the type of drills we would have you do for phase one. And then once you get to phase two, then you can start throwing the ball, the ball to each other and that type of stuff. So. So that, clarify, that's we're not collecting those assessments. Those are just uh, good resources to use okay. as, as indirect yeah. drills. Okay, and my last question is elaborating on the U.S. games. Um, and I'm sure somewhere in my massive number of emails, what's the deadline for track and swimming? Uh, I want to say it's, it's the first week of July um, because it will, will give you a week after um, the season's over, I believe. Uh, July 9th, I believe, Michaela just put up on the screen. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. And I'm still confused about um, the track, state track. You talked about they would qualify in all four events, so you wouldn't have to eliminate them to going to state. So, so we're still using quota. Um, so you, we, we're okay. still limiting the amount of participation. But what I was saying about that is for those who are attending, I, I think we're going to allow them to be in all the events they did at regionals. That way they have a spot at each station. Okay. So how do you determine who you're going to send to state then? Just pick people. I mean, I would, you would, I would go the same route that you would do to your first place finishers first, then second and third and fourth. Until um, our quota is met. But yeah. when they actually go, and they qualified, say, in running long jump, they would be able to do the other three events that they did? Correct. Yep. That, yep. Okay. That, um, and my last question, whoop, I missed it on U.S. At Games for boxing flag football and softball. I saw a little bit in there about co-ed and, and unified. Can you just explain those three real quick? Okay, yeah, I will tell you flag football is separate because it's a kind of a separate thing because it is intercollegiate is the way that they're doing it. So we are actually working with the SO College program with UW-Madison and getting okay. our team through that route. So that one's kind of separate um, and, and, and um, we can go over those. There's some really specific stuff that Special Olympics North America asks us for meeting that requirement. But for, so for softball and bocce, the requirements are going to be a first place finish at state in 2018 or 2019 or advancing to OST for 2021. So okay. uh, because our that's what our deadline is a little bit tighter on that one between that and camp. So that'll okay. be the deadline for that. And the individuals would register for that. You don't have to register a whole team for that with the exception that we are bringing two unified pairs. So we ask the unified pairs to register together for Bocce. Okay. I capish now. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Vicki asked in the chat, will specters be allowed at swim meets? Uh, currently, and this is actually a venue requirement, currently the answer is no. Uh, we would not be having any spectators at indoor events. Uh, again, um, I know there's one of the YMCA's that has a, a stream option. We'll look into some of that stuff for, for spectators. We can't guarantee any of those things. We're not as tech savvy as we'd like to be for some of that stuff. Um, but if they do have those options, we will share those out. Um, and again, this is not necessarily an us rule. That's a that's a um, a lot of our venue rules, but it's also a way for us to keep those numbers the where where we need them to be. Coaches, uh, your if you register an a, an agency of twenty, you would still be allowed to bring in your 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 chaperones for that. So it's not like you're just dropping your athletes off and you're not having anybody part of your agency, but it just be no additional spectators as part of that. So just to clarify that, that's what for indoor events. At this current moment, that is the that is what we're going with for, and I think that's all the way through for um, for the summer sports seasons at this point. So that that's specific to them. All right. Um, again, thank you again for for all of you, especially for everybody who's been in the long haul with us since August for this, um, and we'll look forward to meeting everybody on on the twenty seventh as well. If you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out to myself, your local athletic directors, or the uh, COVID email address, covid at specialolympicswisconsin.org. Um, 
and we'll keep going forward with all this stuff. So thank you again. Have a good night. Hey, Jason, 